Hey everyone, it's James from Zygle Studios. So I made a video on how the Nintendo 64 was really challenging to develop for, and it did really well. So I figured, let's make this a series. The next one on the list is probably the ugly stepchild of modern game development, which is the PlayStation 3. So let's start with what was on the PS3's main board. The CPU uses a cell microprocessor, and what does that really mean? To understand what a cell microprocessor is, you kind of have to understand what a just regular CPU entails. But on a basic level, a central processing unit consists of one or multiple ICs that do things like instruction handling, decoding, control logic, there's ALUs, ACUs, multiplexers, and buffers to store data going in and out. Now with the cell, remember how I mentioned before that there could be multiple ICs doing all these things? Well, there can also be more processing elements inside of that particular CPU itself. And in this case, IBM decided to come up with an idea of using a power PC core of a very mediocre performance, but have multiple coprocessors that did certain things very well. So this is a great idea. You have specialized processing units that will handle certain tasks at a certain time, but you have a very modest CPU so you can budget your power more efficiently. Sounds like a great idea, and actually it was. In fact, this idea has excited developers outside of the gaming world to develop applications for this thing. MIT even had a course for computer science students in this, and you can view it on OpenCourseWare, I'll link it in the description. It's amazing what you can do with the cell technology. To get it to work correctly, there were a lot of things you kind of had to jump in and out of. The first and probably most awkward piece of developing on the PlayStation 3 was that conditional instructions were extremely expensive. What do I mean by that? If you used an if statement that had many different outcomes inside of it, or you used too many if statements, it would be extremely expensive, you'd waste a ton of clock cycles, and then your game would run like crap, really. And this really frustrated a lot of computer scientists, maybe not as many hardware engineers, but certainly a lot of CS-minded folks, because this really makes code look, well, messy. And quite frankly, that's not why video games are developed in the first place to make code look good, it's to make the game run as best as it can. So when I talk about SPUs, I really mean SPEs, and SPE stands for Synergistic Processing Elements. So the PlayStation 3 actually had seven of these, well eight if you include the one that's tooled for production, but six of them were essentially dedicated processing units, and each SPE was composed inside of an SPU. So an SPU included a memory flow controller, so there was a DMA and a memory management unit along with a bus interface. SPEs didn't have any branch prediction hardware, so if statements were extremely expensive. Each SPE had six execution units divided among odd and even pipelines on each SPE. And it had its own instruction set too, which was loaded in quad words, or 128 bits. And this was for single and double precision instructions. What was amazing was that each SPE contained 256 kilobytes of embedded SRAM for instruction data, which is called local storage. Each SPE could even support up to 4 gigabytes of local store memory. However, the local store didn't really operate like a normal cache, since it's not transparent to software, or it didn't contain any hardware structures that predict what data to load. But it did contain 128-bit, 128-entry register file, which allowed it to store data. At one time, an SPE could operate 16 8-bit integers, 8 16-bit integers, and 4 32-bit integers. And the SPE was abstracted such that, in the hardware design, that it couldn't access system memory. So this is why the DMA and the memory flow controller, which was made up of a DMA and MMU and bus interface, was set up this way. So essentially, you had to issue DMA requests from the CPU to talk to these SPUs. The DMA was hooked up to the system address space, and as you can imagine, with six processing units separate from the CPU, memory management was a nightmare. This is not traditional thread setup and concurrency, but you could chain the SPEs together in each step for a complex operation. So, for example, if you're decoding an MP3 file, you could have one SPU that was dedicated to parsing the file, you could have one SPU that was dedicated to piping all the instructions to the audio hardware, and you could have another one that was dealing with the polyphase filter banks. In this sense, on the CPU, you could set up quote-unquote threads, which really were just, well, DMA-issued requests to specific SPUs for things to be done. It was concurrency in a different light. It wasn't really concurrency, it was more doing things 
off the cuff and waiting for things to come back. So this is where priority message queues or things like that became extremely important. Unrolling for loops, putting if statements outside of for loops if you need them, and using what's called single instruction multiple data or SIMD techniques to pipeline data into the specialized 128-bit registers was just a few of the tactics that were used to make these games run smooth. This is where the lack of motivation to make these games came about. Gabe Newell, commonly known as Gaben, actually talked about this a little bit. He was quoted by saying this. The PlayStation 3 makes my life as a software developer much harder. All of a sudden I'm supposed to figure out how to have this asymmetrical, multi-threaded game, <laughs> right? And I've never written a single line of multi-threaded code ever, right? It's not like I was like lying awake saying, I need to re-architect every line of code I've ever written in order to get it to work. So one of my junior programmers who's writing game code rather than system code could slow things down by, in a real world case, by a factor of 80, because they're doing something out in the AI or in the game DLL, which used to be totally safe, and now all of a sudden the whole system just slows down. And then one of the really experienced programmers have to go in and say, oh, you can't tell that you're doing this, you ran out of registry space and this other thing happened, and no, there's no debugger that shows this to you. And writing for SPEs and writing in a PlayStation 3 environment, it's like, there are incredibly few programmers who can safely write code in that environment. You make tiny little changes to code running on one of the SPEs and the entire thing will grind to a halt. And you have no visibility into why that's happening. It's just sort of magically running really, really slow. So why did Sony design the PlayStation 3 this way if it caused such pain for developers? Well, the answer is fairly simple. When you knew what you were doing, it produced some pretty amazing results, and I mean, most people can see that. Developers really had to take a step back here and take a look at the hardware of the system and understand how that worked in order for them to structure their code better. Probably the most amazing thing about the PlayStation 3, though, was the Element Interconnect bus. It connected all the important pieces of the PS3 together. So the PPE processor, the memory controller, the eight SPUs, the two off-chip I.O. interfaces that dealt with serial communication and controller management, and it managed a total of 12 different peripherals in the PS3 itself. It had an arbitration unit, which functions basically as flags for which peripheral is talking. The interconnect bus is implemented as a circular ring consisting of four 16-byte-wide unidirectional channels, which counter-rotate in pairs. This is an awesome concept. With the speed that this was running at, it needed to be like this. So it almost acted like traffic lights. When traffic patterns were okay, each channel could convey up to three transactions concurrently. Now keep in mind that the interconnect bus ran at half the clock speed, so that means that the effective channel rate is 16 bytes every two system clocks. At maximum possible concurrency, it was able to utilize three active transitions from any of the peripherals on each of the four rings. The peak instantaneous bandwidth is 96 bytes per clock. That is unbelievable. Absolutely crazy. But it's just not realistic to scale this number based on the processor speed. The arbitration unit even proposed additional constraints such that you couldn't do it this fast. One game in particular that I'm thinking of that took very good use of the cell architecture is Polyphony Digital's masterpiece, Gran Turismo 5. The graphics are amazing, the performance is astounding, and, well, it's a wonderful game. So development wasn't impossible, but it was challenging. In fact, the game was delayed three or four years. Why? I don't know. I don't know if it was just a perfectionist thing or if it was actually a development push, but either way, PlayStation 3 games were not easy to develop on, and the developers that did do well on it took a lot of time to perfect their efforts. So the next thing we talk about is languages. So the language of choice in PlayStation 3 development was obviously C. C++ might have been used for game logic, but C was the main choice as well as some ISA assembly. So since we're talking about code, we have to talk about compilers. And since we're on a cell microprocessor, which was powered by the PowerPC E-series, it's the Power ISA architecture. And the Power ISA architecture was developed by the Open Power Foundation, which was led primarily by IBM. So that means IBM would be the 
supplier to supply the compiler for you, which is the case. The XLC compiler was the compiler of choice for the cell on the PS3. On GamingBull.com, there was an article from a game developer who had developed anything from the 64 all the way to the PS3. This was his description of the, his PS3 development experience. A 95-pound box shows up on your desk with a printout of the 24-step instructions for how to turn it on for the first time. Everyone tries. Most people fail to turn it on. Eventually, one guy goes around and sets up everyone else's machine. There's only one CPU. It seems like it might be able to do everything, but it just simply can't. The SPUs seem like they should be really awesome, but not for anything you or anyone else is doing. The CPU debugger works pretty okay. There's no SPU debugger. There is nothing like PIX at first. Eventually, some Sony first-party devs got fed up and made their own PIX-like GPU debugger. And the GPU was very, very disappointing. Most people try to stick working with the CPU, but it can't handle the workload. A few people dig deep into the SPUs, and they are fast. Unfortunately, they eventually figure out that the SPUs need to be devoted in almost full-time making up for the weaknesses of the GPU. But the results were stunning. I mean, there's no question that the PlayStation 3 produced some amazing games from it. One such example of this would be Uncharted. The Uncharted series did wonders for the PlayStation, and it looked beautiful. Another good example is The Last of Us. The Last of Us is another amazing-looking game, which was a story-driven piece. And this fits well with the architecture of the PlayStation 3 because of how you were able to task everything, and having minimal draw distance, you could make things close to you look immensely real, but draw distance far away would be a little bit more challenging. This is amazing how the hardware design of systems can actually affect the games that are being developed. And really, I mean, the first look you get of a game is the first impression. So this really pushed developers hard to think differently about games and how they were designed. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want more videos like this in the future, tell me in the comments below and give me some suggestions on what videos I should go for. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe to my YouTube channel because there'll be more videos like this coming soon. Don't forget to check out my C programming tutorials as well, which I've been doing now for the past few weeks. Thanks so much for stopping by, and this is James from Zygel Studios signing off.